Um, I appreciate you giving me the time today. You know, it's an honor to speak before you guys. As Ted said, um, I graduated law school in 96. Got recruited while I was in law school by a technology firm. At the time, in 96, right before the big tech bubble burst, uh, technology was just blowing up. And um, a good friend of mine, who was actually, uh, I'll tell you also, I'm a 30-year martial artist. So a student of mine opened up a firm that was building network networks for large Fortune 500 companies, network integration. Um, and he said, hey, listen, I'd love to have a guy like you on staff. I said, hey, I'm going to be a lawyer. You know, I don't have any interest in really computers. I know enough to turn them on and off, and that's about it. He said, trust me, technology is where it's at. You can always hang a shingle outside. If you like, come in and join us. So I did that, I, I gave it a shot. And I said, you know what, you're right, I guess I can always hang a shingle, but let me, let me test this technology thing out. And um, I very quickly was able to rise within that enterprise to the chief operations officer, and we built a pretty big infrastructure in the United States and in Puerto Rico. Um, and that sort of started me off in the, in the technology world. Um, and very quickly got an opportunity on Wall Street for a company that was building trading technology for institutional companies. And, and that's how I sort of segued into a couple of gentlemen that Ted's very close with um, and got into the investment business. But um, I would say over that period of time, I, I guess I got my law degree, I have a, uh, a major in finance, a minor in marketing, went to Fordham University prior to St. John's Law School, um, and then took some risks and got involved with some businesses that taught me some skill sets that you know every step of the way I've used in everything that I've done. We're able to get a market point, I appreciate that. So if it's okay with you, I'd like to talk a little bit about that today. And, and a couple of things that you know, I think are important for anyone to understand in business, I consider myself a bit of a serial entrepreneur. I've been involved in several different businesses, and by the way, probably the most important asset to have is, is what you mentioned, a positive attitude and an enthusiastic optimistic viewpoint that you can do pretty much anything that you want. And you guys hear that a lot, I guess. You know, when you're in college, you're going to hear it in school, you're going to hear it from your parents. But the reality is it's really true. The limitations that you put on yourself are the limitations you're going to have in this life. Once you take those limitations away, you'll find that opportunities open up all the time. And once you're in the game, more opportunities open up. It's the people that are standing on the sidelines and not in the game that don't wind up getting the opportunities. So a couple of points that I'd like to make. Risk and execution. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that business that Ted referred to. But I think those are the two most important things that I'd like to get across to you guys today, or what you can take away from this. You're in a position right now, at this point in your lives, where you have the ability to take the most risk that you'll ever be able to take. As time goes on, as family comes into play, while life throws different curveballs at you, your ability to take these risks start to diminish. So I would suggest that right now, what you try and do is understand what it is you want to accomplish in your life. Think about those goals that you would aspire to go after and be willing to take some risks. It's okay. It's okay to fail, by the way. Right? They always talk about baseball. A great baseball player hits, what, 300? That means that 70% of the time, they don't get a hit. Only 30% of the time it works out for them. The best players in the world Right, the Hall of Fame, which are hitting 300. Take the risks. And then, once you're willing to take a risk, understand that you must be, you must be willing to execute. Your life cannot be about how do you get the most money for doing the least amount of work. Let me repeat that. Your life can't be about how do I make the most money for doing the least amount of work. That may come later on, after you've succeeded. But in the beginning, you need to be willing to put the work, the time, and the effort. You need to be willing to execute. People around you have to look at you as someone that can execute. Can I give you a job? Can I give you a project? Can I give you a function? And you're going to execute that to the end? Are you going to go A to Z? Or are you going to go A to like C? Right? 100% of the world has an idea. 100% of the world. Everybody has an idea. 85% of them have a plan on how to execute that idea. Maybe three to five percent of them have the actual ability to execute. And when I say execute, I don't mean just start it. Start it, get punched in the face, drop down to one knee, fail a few times, restart it, fail again, start it again, and keep going until you get to that point. 
So I'm going to talk about a few of those things today that I think are important, some ideals that you should have in your mind. And it sounds to me you've gone through a lot of this yourself in your business, all right? Number one, prepare. Okay? Big old P, prepare. That means once you have an objective, whatever that objective is, prepare to succeed. Study that industry. Study that sector of a business. Study that expertise, whether it's through school, it's on your own, on the internet, take an internship, put yourself alongside of someone that's an expert in it, listen to anyone and everyone that's had any experience in that particular business that you can possibly get. Become a sponge and absorb as much information as possible. Prepare for what it is you're about to go into. Then, be ready to test. Test. Test the waters. Okay, at some point you decided on a business to go after, and at some point you had to take that dip into the water, and you had to perform, you had to test, you had to take on your first customer, your first client, right? And during that process, in those initial testings, you're gonna find that some things are working and some things are not working. And I'm gonna get into that in a little bit more detail, giving you a specific example of the way I run my business today. But if you're not willing to prepare and understand the business that you want to get into, well, whatever it is, it doesn't have to be business, right? This, is, this goes for anything in life. And then be willing to dip that toe in the water and test it. And that doesn't mean you have to spend millions of dollars. Test. Put something out there. You have a business, you want to try it, start with one person. Understand what adjustments you need to make. Because that test will ultimately demonstrate adjustments that need to be made. Those adjustments will include a process of elimination. Let me give you an example. I want to market, I'll tell you something we're marketing right now. My company develops a, uh, a pill that when you take this pill, the formulation is such that it will stop you from getting sunburned in the sun. And think about you know, the scalability or the marketplace there. Right, imagine if you can actually take a supplement, a vitamin, and go out and not get sunburned, and not have your body affected by the damaging rays of the sun, the UVA and the UVB. You no longer have to slather yourself up with, or your kids for that matter, with some of these um, lotions that can be pretty toxic. How many of you think that's one of the greatest ideas you ever heard? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. By the way, if you, uh -huh. if you check out my first website for this, the testing website, sunassure.com. And by the way, I'm not here to promote that, I'm just giving an example. Um, <laughs> make sure you write that down. So we have this product that took uh, years of development. Um, a biochemist friend of mine approached me with this. He knows that my company is relatively sophisticated at bringing products to market. We spent a lot of time preparing and studying this market to identify whether there was a real demand. We thought that there is a demand, and now we're going to start. So how do we test? Well, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to spend a fair amount of money on some advertising medium. And what are the advertising mediums in front of me today? The most predominant one is the internet. Then, of course, you have more traditional methods, magazines, print. Print is a lot less impressive today because everyone's digital, but magazines still generate a fair amount of response from consumers. There's the radio. There's TV. So we decided, after exploring all the areas, we were going to try this on the internet and in the radio. And we identified a certain amount of money. And we said, that, well, that's the only amount of money that we're going to spend on this test. And we developed three radio spots, and we ran them for an entire month. In fact, it's still running right now. And explored all the different responses that we were getting from the consumer based on those ads. And we found that there were certain things we weren't doing that we thought we were doing. There were certain messages we were not getting across that we thought we were getting across. How do I know that? Well, I'm getting phone calls, I'm getting hits to my website, I now am generating clients and leads, and I have staff that is reaching back out to those clients and leads and understanding what triggered the event that they contacted us. We put a stimulus out to the market, we studied the response. Once we understood that, we made adjustments. And we're making those adjustments right now. 
and we're changing the way that radio spot reads, and we're changing the way that website is designed so that we can increase that response. And then what we do is once we understand that, we make our adjustments, process of elimination, I eliminate those parts of my marketing that are not working, and I focus my money on the ones that are working. Right? Let me say that again. If I'm spending, hypothetically, $10,000 on per spot on three radio spots, and I identify that two of those spots are not generating the response I'm looking for, why would I continue to spend money on those spots? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get rid of those two spots. This time I'm going to spend $20,000 on a spot that's working, and then I'm going to add in new tests. All right, I'm going to bring in more tests to the environment so I can scientifically start to figure out what's really creating the response that's triggering the return on my media dollar investment that I'm looking for. Does that make sense, guys? Yeah. If anybody has a question, you want to stop me if I'm going too fast, stop me, slow me down. The process of elimination in my adjustments, and then what do I do? I test again. I test again. Only this time, what I did was I spent a little bit more money on those advertisements that were generating a positive response for me, I eliminated the ones that weren't working for me, and I added in more tests. At some point, I'm going to go through this process over and over again until I get to a sustainable level that now I am prepared to scale. Now I know this is working for me. Now I'm going to go and spend more money, or I'm going to go raise more money, or I'm going to go borrow more money. I'm going to do something to step up my efforts now. I identified something that works. I prepared for the marketplace I was in. I put together proper tests. I studied those tests, made my adjustments. I retested. Maybe I did that three or four times. Now I'm ready. I'm ready for business. I can take this thing to the next level. I can start to generate a business that is sustainable over the long run because I did my homework. I prepared. By the way, all along I did two things. I took some risks and I was willing to execute. I didn't just say, yeah, listen, this is a great idea. Let's start it. Let's talk about it for a couple months. Let's talk about it for a few more months. Let's try something real sloppy. It didn't work. Ah, listen, let's go for a beer and forget it. <laughs> no, I got to step back. I got to figure out how to make it. I, I, I had a good plan. Right? A lot of times people, like I said, 100% of the people have a plan. They have an idea. Or I should say 100% have the idea, 85% have the plan. Just stick to that plan. It was a good plan. It had a good idea. Don't give up on it right away. Right? A couple of years back, a couple of years back, probably about 12 years now, when I was on Wall Street, a couple of colleagues of mine um, came up with a thought process to generate some side money, maybe a retirement vehicle for ourselves. We were all doing relatively well on, on Wall Street, but on Wall Street we were sort of um, prisoner to the ebbs and flows of Wall Street and felt that it would be great if we could develop a business on the side that maybe over a couple of years it could turn out to be something. Well, the concept was um, a topically applied, and do you mind if I go through this? No, oh, go ahead. As a, as a topically applied vasodilator. Topically applied vasodilator. A vasodilator is something that allows the body's vessels and capillaries to open up expand and provide better blood, blood flow and oxygen flow. Vasodilators. Vasodilators are used in several different uh, products out there. A lot of uh, weightlifters and bodybuilders um, take some sort of supplement to help their body vasodilate so they can drive more blood and oxygen flow to the muscle that they're training and get a better pump. Um, Pfizer, Lilly, Bayer, they use vasodilators in a lot of their medications and their drugs, um, predominantly Viagra, Levitra, and Cialis. And each of these products do exactly that. They create a vasodilatory effect within the body that provides the desired effect, if you will. And we came up with this concept for a topically applied um, vasodilator. We thought it was an interesting idea. Eh, maybe it'll work, maybe it won't. Let's prepare for the market. And we spent about a year and approximately $100,000 of our own money with biochemists, because we're not biochemists, studying what ingredient base and what actives could be provided to a topically applied base of either. And there were many times where we didn't expect to spend $100,000, we said we'll pretend. 
and then we picked another tenant. Uh, somehow or another, we were looking at we were about $100,000 into this thing. And at some point, we said, okay, we need to now, we've prepared enough. We have something, we think it works. We've gone through all the major manufacturing labs out there. We know that we have a safe product. It's generating the desired effect. Let's see how we test it. And the first thought process, one of my the first thought process was to use it in the sports nutrition environment. Use it for, again, um, weightlifters or athletes that were looking to bring better oxygen and blood flow to a targeted area to increase their capacity, better their performance. And at some point, one of my partners said to me, hey, why don't we use it for male enhancement purposes? And I looked at him and I remember saying, okay, let me get this straight. I'm an attorney. I have every license there is on Wall Street. I've run two broker dealers. We have hundreds of employees underneath us. On top of that, I own five martial arts schools where I teach thousands of children. And you want me to go out and basically market <laughs> this. Do you understand what this will do to our reputation? Said, Get out of my office. I don't even want to talk to you anymore. And he walked out with his head down and said, oh, I'm sorry, I thought it was a good idea. And he walked out. And I remember that night going home and saying to him, my wife, I can't believe that he came to me with this ridiculous idea. And she looked at me and she said, it might not be so ridiculous. Why don't you just take a step back? And I looked at her and I said, what, are you trying to say I have a problem? <laughs> she said, no, no, no. I mean, from a business perspective, it might not be a bad idea. Why don't you take a look at it? So I spent the entire night, when I say the entire night, at least, and I just went through the entire internet on everything I could find. And there were hundreds of pills that claim to do all sorts of crazy things to the anatomy. There were stats on the growth of these prescription drugs that were staggering. On top of that, what I found probably most interesting was that the most widely sold drug on street corners was Viagra. It wasn't crack and cocaine and everything, it was Viagra. I said, oh my God, maybe there is something here. So the next day, I called him back. I said, oh, let's talk about this stupid idea that you had. We sat down, and me and him and one other gentleman, we put together this sort of plan. And the one thing I said was, I said, look, I'm going to tell you right now, if we do this, there's no way that I'm going to be looking at, am I on a, should I speed this up? Move it along. Yeah, there's no way, there's no way that I'm going to do this in any sort of lewd way. I don't want to be in, uh, in sex shops. I don't want to be in porn. I, I want to do this mainstream. And I said, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to talk to an attorney. I spoke to a well-noted corporate attorney, gave me the idea. I said, please, don't laugh at me. He looked at me and said, Frank, I think this is one of the most brilliant ideas I've ever heard. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. We came up with an ad. We prepared for the market. We came up with an advertisement. We spent $5,000 on an advertisement in a print magazine. It was a bodybuilding magazine. And by the way, this is a topically applied vasodilator that you apply directly to the source to generate the desired effect. Within 30 days, we generated $14,000. We had no idea what we were doing, none. We all worked full-time jobs on Wall Street through a website and through a phone number that we put out there that was tied to a voicemail system. We generated $14,000 in 30 days. So think about the return on investment. We spent $5,000, made 14. That's almost three times your money inside of a 30-day period of time. Over the course of 90 days, we made like five and a half times. So we said, you know what? Let's call these people ourselves and let's understand why they, you know, why did they buy? What did they like about it? We did. We adjusted the ads. We tried it again. And every single time we generated between three and five times our dollar. Do you know that in that first year we generated $1.6 million in sales? $1.6 million in sales. Doing this part-time and on the weekends, something that we said, ah, maybe this will be a, uh, a retirement vehicle. Maybe we can make a couple of dollars on the side. We started to dedicate more energy, more time into it. Second year, $3 million. Third year, $6 million. Fourth year, every single year, we doubled to, we were generating between $38 and $42 million annually. On a product that started out, by the way, as one product, and then we moved into extensions, and then we moved into sports nutrition. Now we were, as I said in the beginning, we were in the game. And opportunities started to come to us left and right. People would come, hey, you guys are doing a great job on that. Would you consider uh, using my formulation? Would you consider trying this? Well, I'd like to try this opportunity with you. You guys are phenomenal at marketing. We became very sophisticated at print, radio, TV, internet. 
We became very sophisticated FDA, FTC rules. We had to. We ultimately sold that company to a private equity group at a valuation of $40 million. That private equity group, by the way, when the economy started to tank, stopped paying attention to our little company that they had in their big billion dollar fund. The company started to drop a little bit, and we recently bought that company back for a million five. And now we're restarting a lot of those efforts again. But we were willing to do what? We were willing to take risks. We were willing to put our time and effort in and execute. And then we went into preparing, testing, adjusting, testing again, and then scaling over and over again. I know I don't have a lot of time. I came here late. I wanted to just express one message to you guys. Think about what it is that you're trying to accomplish. I don't care what it is. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a business again. What it is you want to accomplish in your life. Maybe it has something to do with your family, your kids, whatever. I don't know. Whatever it is, be prepared to take some risks early and be prepared to execute. Make sure that people around you see you as someone that can take the ball and run with it. Not someone that throws up smoke and mirrors and talks and talks. Talk only goes so far. Be willing to execute. And when you execute, jump into the game, prepare, test, make your adjustments, test again, sell. If you could get nothing else out of this conversation, remember those things, I hope, I hope they'll help you in something, even if it comes to school. I'm sorry, Ted, okay. that was a little late. Uh, That was a tremendous presentation uh, by Frank, and uh, the things that he did tell you apply to any business that prepare, the testing, test more, and then test more on top of that will help you avoid losing too much money. Okay, as you saw from his products, and uh, he's here today because we're talking about doing further business products overseas and other things, because this is just a very small piece of what Frank does in his normal day. He's been very modest, but he's done some really tremendous things. He's a very young guy, not much older than you guys. And, um, you know, and he's got a long, very profitable career ahead of him. So thanks very much for coming My in pleasure. today. Uh, any last minute questions for Frank? Yes, sir. Frank, how did you, uh, I just don't understand, like somebody who works in finance, going to come up with like a pharmaceutical? Because I know most entrepreneurs, it's like a business idea, a finance mm -hmm. idea, but this is like something that's it's, it's a great question because one doesn't match the other, yeah. right? As I said, the, the colleagues and the partners that I ultimately went to business with were all Wall Street guys. And, and one of them happened to be a bodybuilder. And he said one day, I think that there's a marketplace for this particular application because I know a lot of my friends that are working out in the gym, they're always looking for some way to get a better pump, some way to give them a better workout and get better results. And I like this concept. And I said, well, you know, I don't know much about that. I mean, I, I worked out, but I wasn't a bodybuilder. Um, I said, well, come back to me with some ideas. And he came back with this particular idea. And that idea went from the nutritional supplement side and sports nutrition to enhancement. And it just, it was one of those bridges that nobody expected to ever make, but it was there. It was there. And it started because we got together, three guys got together and said, hey, you know, listen, we're doing this Wall Street gig, it's great, let's come up with something else. Let's throw some ideas on the table. And we explored many different ideas. It never hurts to put together a little brainstorming session. You'll be amazed what you find out there. Yes? In terms of market, how did you guys market out such a product when you guys are all Wall Street people? What exactly did you do to get people to, other than a great product, of mm -hmm. course, other than that, how did you get people to be so interested within the first 30 days? Well, great question. You know, first of all, I thought we had, I, I thought we had a, a market that created uh, an interesting demand, and the, the thing we didn't needed to do was to create some urgency to that demand, right? So we said, look, we can't run this business. We don't have employees. We don't have an infrastructure. We don't have an office. So how do we get a business off the ground? Well, developing a website is not difficult to do. We were uh, friends with some graphic designers back in the day. We didn't have Wix, by the way, which you guys, it's a great site. And I highly recommend you guys use it for yourselves. Um, I had a friend of mine develop a website. We purchased a vanity number, which is not a lot of money. A vanity number is just a, a phone number that you drive calls to. And we set that up to a voicemail system and had a fax line. We put an ad out that had, the ad basically said, are you having issues with this? Then try this, right? And we had a little coupon there that said you can either send in this coupon, you can call this number, or you can go to this website. 
didn't require any work from us whatsoever. Once the website was built and the phone number was attached, we weren't answering the calls, by the way. The calls were going straight to a voicemail system. And at night, when I got home, and I had a little infant in my hand, I was on the phone calling these customers back and said, hey, you called up with some interest in this product. Let me tell you about it. And that's how the process started. By the way, eventually, we had a 150-person call center ourselves in Edison, New Jersey, wow. doing inbound and outbound. I have a question. How do you, um, during this like business process, did you encounter like a really like a serious like roadblock, and how did you overcome? Or, um, or, or, or issue? You know, I could tell you right now, I, I never encountered a roadblock. Okay. I encountered thousands. Okay. Of roadblocks. <laughs> okay. oh. um, we we had no idea what the regulatory landscape was, which is intense. Once you're, once you're selling a product to the consumer base, you cannot just sell a product because you got great product, right? There's their safety issues, there's efficacy issues. You have to make sure that your claims are in line with what the FTC considers as a fair claim. The FDA is gonna care if you're gonna sell a cosmetic, which anything topically is considered cosmetic, or a nutritional supplement, are you making any claims that veer into the drug world? You know, there was so many times that we got stopped in our tracks, merchant processing, Merchant processing. We think this is great. We got a merchant processor, right? The merchant processor gave us a, um, and Ted, you know this better than anybody, gave us a limit, $10,000. We thought that was awesome. But don't forget, we generated $14,000 in the first month. The first month, we generated 1.6 in the first year. Merchant process, we blew them up left and right. They, they shut us down at some point. You're capped out, you're capped out. So we had to figure out how to work with the merchant processing relationships and the affiliates that are out there and the associations to demonstrate our credit worthiness to get our limits up, right? Because the banks are afraid. They're afraid that the chargebacks is not gonna work and that he'll be out of business and they'll take the money and the banks won't be able to come back to him to get the money. So mm -hmm. that's why he's saying that the merchant accounts are such an important thing in the direct response business. It really is, and I'll tell you what, I didn't realize back then that a credit card purchase is really a, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a loan that the bank is giving you. Not, if you're the purchaser, not you, but me as the vendor, the merchant, I'm getting a loan. Because at any point, you can apply for a refund or a chargeback. They already paid me the money. If I went out of business, they lost that money. So they cap you, right? And they put restrictions on how you can process your, your, your credit card. We didn't know anything about that at the time. Um, scalability in terms of the formulation itself. We were literally, we were so afraid that people were gonna steal our formulation that we were buying the actives from four different manufacturers, having them sent to our homes and mixing this stuff ourselves. I'm not exaggerating, all right? And we had a machine that we poured this stuff into tubes and this, the machine heated, heat sealed the tubes and we sent them out ourselves. We had to figure out, okay, now what? Now we have to find the proper manufacturing um, resources that can do this all themselves. <coughs> We have to find out the, f the proper fulfillment methodologies. We can't keep shipping out of our house. Every step of the way, we encountered roadblocks. Every step of the way, there were 10 reasons why we should stop. Every day. And I can't tell you how many people tried to copy us. How many people saw that we were making money and tried to copy us, but they didn't have our, our fortitude. They didn't have our passion. They didn't have our willingness to keep going, and they just fell off to the wayside. Great, that last question. Very quickly. Hi, Frank. Hi. Well, that's, that's probably one of the greatest questions you could possibly ask. You know, make sure that the path that you're going down is predetermined by you as to what you're looking to accomplish. If for your business, for example, you want to stay within that medium, then don't let somebody drive you into a business where you're selling apples and oranges, right? Stay within those opportunities that allow you to capitalize on the momentum that you've already created for yourself. Um, you know, if, if, we're, if we started to develop a business within the nutrace, nutraceutical and cosmeceutical markets, uh, I'll give you an example. Somebody came to us with the opportunity to import lumber overseas. And one of my partners said, I want to do this. I told him, thanks, but no thanks. That might be a great business. I don't know, but we're doing this right now. So show me opportunities that are within the nutritional supplement or the cosmetic markets, and we'll go for it. I don't want to do something that's going to distract me from our objectives. 
right? Somebody came to us and said, I want to open up a string of car washes. It's a cash business. Wonderful, that's great. Go buck wild with yourself. I'm not interested. <laughs> Show me something that's going to stay within this lane. Now, you give me an opportunity, let's say, for example, I have a formulation to do X. You have a formulation that can do Y. Well, let's sit down and talk about that because I've already built a machine that allows me to market certain products within a particular category. Now let's see how we can grow upon that. For example, Sun Assure. All right, Sun Assure has nothing to do with that market. However, it's a nutritional supplement that I can market within the machine that I built over 12 years. And I could do it relatively easily because I already have the network of media buyers, fulfillment houses, merchant processors, all the things that go online with that. Right? So that's an opportunity that I'm going to want to capitalize on. Does that make sense? Okay. Well, thanks very much. <laughs>